This week we get our second telling of John the Baptist story, this time from the Gospel according to John and how that was perceived. Now it's important to remember that the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of John have two very different energies, have two very different uh, focuses, have two different versions of the telling of the story. I mean, it's the same Jesus, but in the same John the Baptist, but where they choose to put their emphasis is different in both of them. For John, right up front, everything, there's no question, Everybody knows who the Messiah is. Everybody knows that John the Baptist is not that person, except the scribes and the Pharisees who have the courtesy of coming to ask the questions. But there's no confusion about what is going on. Whereas in Mark, everything was hidden. Everything was behind a veil. In fact, the only people in Mark who will recognize Jesus as the Messiah are the demons. And Jesus tells each of them, don't say anything. So very different, uh, different energy, different focus. So the John the Baptist we meet this week isn't the kind of picturesque wild man or Hagrid or Grizzly Adams from the Gospel of Mark. We get no physical description of him whatsoever. But we have someone who is very philosophical, someone who is inviting people in and teaching them, um, letting them know more about the Messiah. Now the Messiah was something that was expected at this time in history. So there's no, uh, there's no surprise there in, as far as people looking for the Messiah. In fact, if we break down the, I guess four, three anyway, main groups of Hebrew folks at the time, they fall into three or four different categories. First being the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the very rich. Um, they were the temple, the elites of the elites. Um, much like today in our churches, where the, the very wealthy are given uh, a sense of honor and listened to, far disproportionate to their actual personality, just simply because they have money. So they're get, given a different sense of reverence. So we did Sadducees, who were very by the book, very strict. They, if it was not in the Bible, didn't matter to them, didn't exist. So they did not believe in the Messiah at all. And then you have the Pharisees, who were uh, kind of the academics that rose up out of the people. And there's a, a good reason to believe that Jesus was actually a Pharisee. And in this gospel, we get a hint at that that might be a possibility. These were the people who studied, who came from average families, not poor, because the poor didn't get a chance to study. Um, quite frankly, not unlike today. Uh, so these are middle class, generally, people who, uh, men, um, who... Uh, saw that the faith was more than just the writings of Moses or the gospel of the Torah, or sorry, not the gospel, uh, the Torah, the Tanakh, however you want to look at it. They saw it also as actions and, and physicality and motions and um, what you wear. So it was a whole package. There's a reason we recognize these things in Judaism today, because modern Judaism grew out of the Pharisee sect of the Hebrew tradition. Then we have the Essenes. Now the Essenes were a little bit interesting, um, actually a lot interesting. They were a primarily monastic group of people, mostly men, although scholars say not exclusively, but they were, um, aesthetic. They were, um, they were the ones that believed in, in daily rituals of bathing known as in a in mikvah or in, in, uh, in the river. It had to be running water of some kind. They were very strict about what they ate. They were very strict about their interpretation and they believed, much like the Pharisees did, in a Messiah that was going to come. They also believed in armed rebellion more than the Pharisees or the Sadducees would. So they can be a little rough and tumbling at times, but they also remove themselves, kind of like the, um, uh, the cave dwellers in the, uh, in the early Christian church, the hermits who went off. They kind of took um, some of their imagery from the Essenes. And then there's the fourth group that scholars are not really convinced existed, but they might have. And that's known as the Zealots. And they were the, basically the war flank of the Hebrew tradition, the one that stirred up most of the trouble, the one who was really, really disappointed when Jesus and the rest of the Jesus followers were not into militarily overthrowing the Romans. So we have these three or four groups going on. 
John the Baptist is probably in the Pharisee tradition. Although he might be Sadducee, but I think it's Pharisee depending on, on how you understand his parents. He believed in the Messiah. He believed in, in something more. And he had that calling to come and make way for the light. And it says in the beginning of John that, that I am not the light, or, the, or John rather is not the light, but he came to make way for the light. And he told the people what was coming. Now, now just to back up a little bit also of what the expectations were, um, it was believed that the coming of the Messiah would be uh, announced by a returned Elijah. So Elijah and Jesus are actually the only two characters. Actually, no, Jesus did die. Elijah is the only character in the entirety of the Bible, Hebrew and Christian uh, scriptures, that didn't die. He was just taken up to heaven. And there was, it's believed that he will return to announce the coming of the Messiah. In fact, if you have the opportunity to spend holidays, especially Passover, with any of, um, of your Jewish friends or family, you will know there is a, a, a part of the ceremony where they either leave the door open or they set a place at the table or both for the coming of Elijah. They're waiting for that message to come. Well, the Gospel of John sets up John the Baptist to be the new Elijah almost, the one who is coming ahead to announce. And prior to that, the one who was going to return to announce the coming of the messenger who would announce the Messiah, so that's two loops back, was Moses. Moses was promised so many things and died before he actually entered the land of, of Israel. And this was an opportunity for Moses, the ultimate prophet, to come back and announce things. So that's the setting we have when we look at the gospel today. So we have a situation where John is baptizing by the Jordan River and the scribes, the Pharisees come out of Jerusalem, come out of the temple to John to challenge him, to question him. Because again, remember, this is all about politics. The temple leadership is very worried about what a return Messiah might mean vis-a-vis -vis their relationship with their Roman overlords. So that, that level of concern is never going to go away. And I mean, it's, it's the concern that eventually does lead to Jesus' death. But they want to get a grasp on this. They want to know what's really going on. So they go out, a certain group of them go out, and they approach John. And they say, who are you? Are you the Messiah? Are you who we're waiting for? And John says, no, I'm not. Then are you Elijah? No, I'm not. Are you Moses then? So they're going back a loop each time they ask a question. He says, no, I'm not. I'm the one who comes to say, make way. And that's a reference to Isaiah, another highly respected prophet. So they have this experience with John the Baptist where he is very much telling them that Jesus is already here. He even tells them he is with you, which, you know, scholars kind of wonder, does that just mean that Jesus has been around, they've seen him and don't know it? Um, does that mean that Jesus is a Pharisee, which a lot of scholars think he might have been? How that relationship develops, we don't know. But they are scared to find out who this is. And when John does not give them an easy answer, they try the soft pedal. They say, well, we need to have an answer to go back and tell the people that we are sent by so that everybody can relax a little bit about what's going on here. Because remember, John the Baptist is pulling in crowds from all over the place. They like the message. They like the, the sound of repentance. They, they like the calling to a renewed life. And they really, really like the announcement that the Messiah is going to be there soon because they all kind of believe that the Messiah is the one that's going to remove the Romans and get them back to being a land where they're just their own people, not any foreign government being in charge. So those who are beholden to said foreign government want to make sure they have a really, really clear idea of what's going on. And John the Baptist does not satisfy them. He does, however, tell them that someone is coming, already here, but will present themselves shortly that the time is now. 
And that is our setting for the Gospel of John. As we prepare for this Advent season, we are reminded of the anticipation of the people. As Christians, we're going through the, the additional um, ceremony that we do every year, the celebration of preparation for the birth of Jesus, and that in the stable in Bethlehem. Notice that Mark and John don't have that story. That's only a, a Matthew and Luke thing. We are preparing for that, but the wider church that we're reading about right now, the wider community, the first communities, were preparing for the first time Jesus came as an adult to make a difference. Who they are expecting will not be who they get, but there will be times when those two images are molded slightly, or those who are expecting a military leader will understand the mistake and gravitate a little bit more towards Jesus. Um, that third group, I mentioned the Essenes, they're believed to play a really large role in the formation of the early church. The baptism that John shows could very well be the, the daily mikvah, the daily washing that the Essenes practice as a way of removing the, the, the guilt, the, the sin, the, the whatever from the day before or the life before and becoming new beings because that is what John is about. There's a, there's a sense of renewal and anticipation. And yes, the establishment is feeling a great deal of fear, but the people are feeling incredible anticipation. What they have been waiting for, for over 200 years, that's how long the, the belief in the Messiah has been sustaining these people, for over 200 years is about to begin in their lifetimes. The energy is high on this. And this is how we step in the third week of Advent, moving towards Bethlehem, moving towards the birth of Jesus. But the joy and the palpable excitement of people that the world is about to change. <laughs>